Good evening. U.S. Secretary of Defense Ashton Carter is in India on a three-day visit. A slew of agreements are expected to be signed between India and the United States during his visit. After arriving in India, Carter said that the strategic confluence between U.S. and India is one reason why the India-U.S. partnership is destined to define the 21st century. Tonight, we will ask if Carter's India visit is likely to boost the global strategic partnership between India and the U.S. and scale up the transformation being witnessed in different cooperation between the two countries. To discuss the same, we are joined by Meera Shankar. She is a former Indian ambassador to the United States, uh, Air uh, Vice Marshal retired, Manmohan Bahadur. He is distinguished fellow with the Center for Air Power Studies and C. Uday Bhaskar, strategic affairs analyst. He's also director with Society for Policy Studies. I welcome you all to this show. I'll begin with you, Ms. Shankar. How do you see the transformation that we are currently witnessing in the defense relationship between India and the U.S. in the wake of so much focus on Make in India and defense sector and the defense trade and technology initiative? Well, I think the India-U.S. defense partnership has been one of the most promising areas of cooperation between the two countries in recent years. Uh, you will recall that uh, we hardly used to buy anything from the United States because of our historical uh, problems uh, with them on defense sales. Uh, but in recent years, I think defense trade has um, expanded rapidly and I think it's US now, is now the biggest arms supplier yes, to about India. 13 billion dollars uh, worth of defense trade has uh, taken place or is on the anvil but more than the trade um, more than the exercises they are also the country with whom we do the maximum number of military exercises I think is the new willingness on the part of the United States to also to see where they can uh, work with India's own priorities under the Make in India initiative. So for the first time under the Defense Technology and Trade Initiative, they have accepted that looking beyond defense trade, mm -hmm. uh, they will also look at joint research, joint development, joint production of systems. And when President Obama came here, mm -hmm. we had agreed on four pathfinder projects, That's small right. projects basically, but useful in terms of building the confidence that the two countries can work together. Mm -hmm. um, and I think um, on one of them, progress has been made. Absolutely. Um, then there were more ambitious projects which we wanted uh, on the agenda. Uh, for instance, to work together on jet engine technology and also to work together and on that could aircraft, be very much on the agenda according to some carrier reports. carrier technology. And there we have two groups which have been set up which are in the process of discussing these issues. Um, we also have the you know, vision statement for the Asia Pacific. We'll come to was, that, Ms. Shankar, but okay. let me bring in other guests for now. Uh, Air Marshal uh, Bahadur, he, she referred to uh, the joint vision for Asia-Pacific region that uh, India and the United States released uh, during uh, the visit of uh, Barack Obama to India. How uh, crucial is the operationalization of that vision going to be as far as the Asia-Pacific region is concerned? Uh, it's vital, uh, basically because we are also looking or acting east. And uh, we need to partner, and that's how steps are being taken you find the Indian Navy more towards the east sailing more towards the east uh, we have got one uh, oil block in the South China Sea so uh, the vision for the Asia Pacific in which India has uh, a role a substantial role to pay to play uh, is vital uh, as we move towards establishing better relations with our neighbors which lie east and southeast of us so uh, military diplomacy is one part, a major part of this vision uh, in which uh, the Navy is there leading the show, if I can say that, as, as, as also the Army and the Air Force. Uh, Air Force has got uh, uh, people in Malaysia uh, for the Su-30 training team. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are moving eastwards. And the Army is also there in terms of training, uh, uh, training people. Our exercises are also on. So uh, the presence of the Indian military in furthering this joint vision in, in the East and Southeast and Asia Pacific is important. 
Mm -hmm. And how do you see the fact, uh, Commodore Bhaskar, that between India and United States, if you look at the number of military exercises that are taking place uh, involving the Army, the Navy, as well as the Air Force, uh, India or the U.S. does not have so many exercises as of now with any other country. So how crucial is this and what does this say about the defense relationship between India and U.S.? Well, I would say that the fact that India and the United States engage as many times as they do across the three services is a very important indicator and it's one of the distinctive features because one of the more anomalous shall we say characteristics is that India is not a formal military partner it's not an alliance partner with the United States so while the US does carry out a number of military exercises with many of its alliance partners whether it's an Australia or a Japan or a South Korea within this region India is the exception in many ways and that is what I would aver makes the India-US defense and military relationship very, very distinctive. And what was outlined, I think, at the political level between President Obama and Prime Minister Modi on the last visit was a vision that both the countries shared. It's an objective. And that really has to do with what kind of a strategic environment both countries see as desirable mm -hmm. within the extended, what we now refer to as the Indo-Pacific, and here I think the subtext is about how Asia is going to be managed, if you will, in terms of its strategic challenges. And the how one crucial is that vision uh, in the wake of an assertive China? That's the point. I was just coming to that okay. saying that the subtext is about China, meaning that there is a Chinese aspiration. We see that now more recently in the Xi Jinping leadership, which is a combination, I would again submit, of a certain degree of very prickly nationalism, and it's being complemented by a uh, assertion of Chinese history, which is what the claim in the South China Sea is all about. And you can see that the entire neighborhood is very disturbed. Now, the anomaly is that India, China, and the United States have a very deep economic and trade engagement at a much higher level between China and the US, at a relatively lower level, but very important for India because China is going to soon become the number one trading partner by a long margin, even mm -hmm. in comparison to the others. So I think that's the challenge at the political level. How do you manage the strategic challenge of Asia where you have this quote-unquote rising China which is not willing to accept the existing rules and norms and that's most visible in the South China Sea which is which why for the first time you see UN that yeah convention exactly. on law of the seas exactly. which is mentioned in the, in the joint vision, vision statement okay now uh, Ms. Shankar you referred earlier in your answer to the need for a consonance between uh, the US defense suppliers and the kind of technology transfer that they want uh, to have in India and the kind of joint production that they want in India and what India requires uh, why is there a need for such a consonance has that consonance been lacking in recent times and what role is the US Congress likely to pay in play in future will there be bipartisan support for further technology transfer as a change in presidency takes place um, let me say that when I went as ambassador to the US there were legacy issues in terms of uh, uh, the level of technology which the US was willing to transfer to India and the procedures that were in place. We were designated in a very low category along with Sudan and Vietnam and the procedures for export of defense technologies or dual use technologies to India were very very cumbersome um, and uh, not easy. But while I was there we worked to actually raise India's categorization and uh, we were given the designation of you know their closest partners not ally but one level below which considerably eased the procedures for defense technology and um, uh, dual use technology transfers to india so the question of a relationship where we are looking at joint research production is something relatively new mm -hmm. there was not a willingness on the part of the US to contemplate this mm -hmm. and India also was not really at that time uh, looking for uh, for this okay. but it's a reflection of the growing confidence and trust that the two countries have in each other that we have been able to progress to this now I think progress will be incremental 
it's not going to be you know suddenly mm -hmm. that because there are many technical issues uh, to be worked around including of intellectual property okay. including the fact that most of the technology in the US mm -hmm. is held by private companies so to what extent would they be willing to share or produce in India all those questions will be addressed when we are discussing this with the US okay. but what this does is now that we have this framework we have a defense new defense cooperation agreement yes which uh, extends the defense framework agreement by, by 10, 10 years. years then we have the defense technology and trade initiative that's right and then we have you know in the uh, maritime domain uh, uh, identified the areas where we would like to work together so there is a huge expanse the, that needs yes, to be covered and this includes the issue of nuclear terrorism it includes counter piracy counter terrorism as well yeah counter terrorism it, it includes uh, natural disasters search and rescue okay. Okay. so there is a very broad range of areas where we have agreed to work together mm -hmm. i think the challenge for us will be to concretize specific opportunities mm -hmm. in a way which is consistent with india's own requirements okay. and priorities okay and also to concretize or operationalize the vision for the Asia Pacific which was set out. Absolutely. So there is a huge uh, scope in this relationship sure. uh, between India and the United States as far as the strategic sphere and defense sphere is concerned. We will uh, take a break at this point in time. We are discussing tonight the significance of US as Secretary of Defense uh, Ashton Carter's visit to India. We'll come to the specific expectations after a short break. प्रधानमंत्री ग्राम सड़क योजना ने हम गांव वालों के लिए तरक्की के रास्ते खोल दिए सड़क के गड्ढो की फोटो खींच रहे हो कोई खास बात है क्या अरे काका मेरे मोबाइल फोन में मेरी सड़क ऐप है जिससे प्रधानमंत्री ग्राम सड़क से जुड़ी कोई भी जानकारी सरकार तक भेजी जा सकती है सड़क से जुड़े सुझाव या शिकायत पर सरकार वाजिब कार्यवाही करती है प्रधानमंत्री ग्राम सड़क से जुड़ी कोई भी बात मेरी सड़क एंड्रॉइड ऐप अब हर पल मेरे साथ मुबारक हो सेठ जी आके चौधराइन आई गई कर्जा मांगने आओ आओ चौधराइन राम राम सेठ जी सुना है बिटिया की शादी तय हो गई है हाँ सेठ जी बहुत अच्छा घर आना है कुछ रुपए पैसों की मदद हो तो नहीं नहीं सेठ जी मैंने इसके लिए ग्रामीण डाक जीवन बीमा पहले से ही करा रखा है फिर भी जरूरत हुई तो दूसरी पॉलिसी आरोप लोन ले लूंगी मैं तो बस ये न्यौता देने आई हूँ ग्रामीण डाक जीवन बीमा ताकि आपकी शान हमेशा बनी रहे अरे सुबह सुबह इतनी जल्दी मचा रखी है हाँ किससे मिलने जाना है हाँ सौ रुपए लिए लौटा दूंगी अब बाय पापा आप में से कौन कौन विदेश में हायर स्टडीज के लिए लोन लेना चाहता है मैडम इंटरेस्ट कितना होगा इसके लिए अब चिंता करने की कोई जरूरत नहीं है सरकार की पढ़ो पर देश स्कीम के तहत जो भी अल्पसंख्यक स्टूडेंट विदेश में पोस्ट ग्रेजुएट डिप्लोमा मास्टर्स एम फिल पी जैसी हाई स्टडीज के लिए लोन लेना चाहता है उसके इंटरेस्ट पर सरकार सब्सिडी दे रही है यानी आपके एजुकेशन लोन का इंटरेस्ट अब सरकार चुकाएगी अधिक जानकारी के लिए लॉग इन करें www.minorityaffairs.gov.in पर आप हमारे हेल्पलाइन टोल फ्री नंबर वन एट जीरो जीरो वन वन टू जीरो जीरो वन आरोप भी कॉल कर सकते हैं सबका साथ सबका विकास माँ माँ मेरा जन्मदिन कब है बेटा फागुन में हुई थी तू खूब बारिश हो रही थी तेरे वो जौनपुर वाले रामलाल चचा है ना उनकी शादी के चार दिन बाद अरे वो गौरी है ना अपनी बचिया उससे बस एक दिन बड़ी काश इन्होंने भी बर्थ रजिस्ट्रेशन कराया होता बर्थ सर्टिफिकेट स्कूल में एडमिशन सरकारी नौकरी वोटर आई कार्ड और पासपोर्ट हासिल करने में मदद करता है इसे आप बच्चे के जन्म स्थान आरोप इक्कीस दिन के भीतर ग्राम पंचायत कार्यालय या स्वास्थ्य केंद्र ऐसी बिल्कुल मुफ्त पाए धन्नी सी जान की पहली पहचान गांव का स्कूल अब समय पर खुलता है शिक्षक भी नियम से आते हैं गांव का स्वास्थ्य केंद्र डाकघर बैंक सब सुचारू रूप से चल रहे हैं रोजगार के अवसर भी बढ़े हैं और ये सब मुमकिन हुआ है प्रधानमंत्री ग्राम सड़क योजना के कारण शहर को जोड़ते राह विकास खोलते गाँव गाँव में बनी सड़क प्रधानमंत्री ग्राम सड़क गाँव गाँव का विकास प्रधानमंत्री ग्राम सड़क योजना के साथ उंगली धाम के जिसने चलना सिखाया कड़ी मेहनत करके हमको पढ़ाया हमारी खुशियों को अपनी खुशी बनाया 
जिंदगी के हर सुख दुख में जो एक साया बनकर साथ रहे ढलती उम्र में इन्हें अकेला न छोड़ें। ध्यान रखें माता पिता एवं वरिष्ठ नागरिक भरण पोषण एवं कल्याण अधिनियम 2007 के तहत माता पिता की देखभाल करना हमारा कर्तव्य है और उनको बेसहारा छोड़ना एक दंडनीय अपराध है सामाजिक न्याय और अधिकारिता मंत्रालय भारत सरकार द्वारा जनहित में जारी Welcome back with U.S. Secretary of Defense Ashton Carter saying that a strategic confluence between U.S. and India is one reason why the India-U.S. partnership is destined to define the 21st century. Tonight we are asking if the India-U.S. strategic and defense partnership will get a leg up during Carter's India visit. So, uh, uh, Vice Marshal Bahadur, what are the specific agreements that we are looking at under the DTTI platform between uh, India and the United States during the visit of Ashton Carter. Also, how is this expected to give a leg up to modernization of India's armed forces? Uh, the, the Americans are making a great push for their fighter aircraft, the F-16 or the F-18, and they say that they will transfer all manufacturing facilities to India. While we are trying to seal another deal for the Rafale that is correct. fighter While aircraft the Rafale with the French. Deal is also happening. I mean, the discussions are on. So uh, uh, there is politics to it, certainly. Uh, but we must add uh, to what uh, the ambassador said just before on on the expansion of the the, co the contacts between the two um, governments and the two industry industries of the two countries. Uh, the what the in, what we are looking for is technology. We are not looking for screwdriver technology where aircraft are made out, are parts are made outside and assembled in India. So. We have to be careful. While that could well be a start of, of, of events, but at some point of time, within uh, any project that is taken up, technology transfer should start happening. That is vital. And that is what I'm sure the Indian MOD would be insisting, our defense minister would be insisting. Uh, but the IPR and other things are held by private, uh, private individuals or companies in America. And that's where the... Uh, the U.S. government has to step in and... There are also reports of some dissonance between the Pentagon and the private U.S. defense suppliers in terms of uh, technology transfer to India. Are there uh, you see, the any point truth is, in such no, reports? No one would like to give the cutting-edge technology to any other country. That's a fact and that we have to accept. But if there has got to be a special relationship between, between India and the U.S., if there's going to be a strategic outlook to our relations for the next 20 years plus, then there has to be some give and take. And that's what we are looking at, not screwdriver technology. Uh, the important things that may happen, uh, one is uh, for the Air Force, if something happens on the fighter aircraft, uh, on the Army side is the M777, the, the, artillery, the, the artillery, artillery guns. And for the Navy, it's uh, the uh, aircraft carrier, something on that, and the jet engine technology. But these are all cutting edge, cutting mm -hmm. edge uh, schemes. Both Carter and Parikar uh, would be boarding the INS Vikramaditya. Is it just a matter of coincidence that Navy becomes the first point of contact whenever Carter comes to India? Well, I'd like to say in lighter way that the Navy is always the first point of contact. But of <laughs> course, you know that. You know, seriously, I think it's. Uh, reflection of the way in which India and the United States have actually prioritized the maritime domain. As we said earlier, there is a certain strategic context to Asia now which is manifest in the Indo-Pacific. The United States is a maritime power and it has certain interests in the region and the global orientation would suggest that the rise of China and the way in which the United States is already <coughs> positioned in Asia and India's own aspiration. The first point of contact is going to be maritime and therefore the need I think for a certain degree of equipoise in the maritime domain and that is India's objective. If you see Prime Minister Modi's you know, articulation, in every major forum that he has spoken, he has outlined India's maritime vision. He's also spoken about Sagar, that is security and growth for all in the region and concurrently suggested that all the major players should play by a certain set of rules, mm -hmm. norms that international law or otherwise obligates. And therefore, I would suggest that if Mr. Carter came last time, and he was in Vishakhapatnam, and this time, of course, much of the engagement is on the aircraft carrier and other visits, it's part of the way in which the two sides are looking at this. I don't want to call it low-hanging fruit, but I just want to say that this is the most conducive domain for 
the engagement that we have between the two countries okay. and also if I may add I think India and the United States will be looking at the new continuum that is the extended global common which is maritime to cyber and space okay which I believe is the new domain mm -hmm. as far as military capability Maybe is we'll concerned. see that reflected in the next strategic dialogue perhaps, between perhaps. the two and sides. Perhaps, China is invested in all of this, mm -hmm. so that is something we have to keep in mind. Okay. Do you expect, uh, Ms. Shankar, um, India to take it up with the U.S., uh, their continued supply of uh, fighter aircraft and military helicopters to Pakistan, for instance, F-16s? Um, I think the Indian government has expressed its disappointment at the uh, sales of this military equipment to Pakistan. And I think the point that concerns India is that whatever assistance the U.S. gives to Pakistan should be more narrowly focused at building counter-terrorism capabilities rather than on conventional equipment, which basically complicates India's security environment and really would be used against India. So I think in structuring partnerships with other countries, it's important for the two countries to keep the sensitivities of the other side in mind. All right, so you expect India to take that up. Now, uh, Air Marshal Bahadur, do you expect any forward movement on the three bilateral foundation agreements in defense, LSA, SISMOA, as well as BEKA, over which India has had reservations? Because there are some reports that with caveats, India maybe uh, could uh, well accept LSA. Uh, yes, and uh, the point is that these three foundational <coughs> agreements, the Americans, the, the U.S. has been insisting on, and we have, I think it's a, a political issue, mm -hmm. um, whether to accept them fully, partially, and is there, a, first of all, is there something which is partial? Because we have to be uh, clear that when it comes to implementation of American laws, the U.S. government actually says that this is our law, sorry. So once we buy or get into a relationship with the U.S. and buy their equipment, we have to be careful that if these agreements, uh, that these agreements do not become barriers to their Can you usage. explain to the viewers uh, why India has reservations vis-a-vis -vis these three agreements and if India signs them in uh, the current form that they are, what will it mean for us? For example, the LSA, the Logistics Support Agreement, which says <laughs> that uh, there can be barter of uh, services that have been given, for example, fuel, water, food, etc., with transiting aircraft, okay. transiting ships. Uh, what happens if uh, the U.S. is in a conflict with some country or uh, in the Middle East or West Asia and trans their, their equipment is trans tra transiting through India and we are supporting them with fuel, <coughs> water, etc. So are we assisting them against a third country which is friendly to us? These are political issues that mm -hmm. the government of India has to be wary of. When it comes to, for example, SISMOA, it's, uh, it's uh, the communication interoperability and security. Our equipment and their equipment, we have to share certain codes and certain ways to get along. What if our equipment is French? What if our equipment that we are using is Russian? Mm -hmm. So do they also come in? How do they come in? How do we factor in? And when it comes to uh, BECA, it's the exchange of, um, uh, of uh, information about our, uh, for example, the seabed, <coughs> the resources available, uh, how far do they go? I mean, can we get something from the Americans in the American coast which interests us rather than they have more interest in getting something along our coasts? So these, uh, these are issues that the government uh, is grappling with. So the government needs to ensure that these agreements that they are signed are actually in mutual interest of both the countries. That's Your quick right. last uh, comment, uh, uh, Commodore Bhaskar, on the key takeaways from this visit that you expect. Well, I think the key takeaway to my mind is the fact that Dr. Carter is here within the year. He was here in 2015, he's here in 2016. And as the architect of the DTTI, the Defense Technology and Trade Initiative, I think this is a very valuable platform or a framework. And it complements the Indian vision, Prime Minister Modi's emphasis and focus on make in India. Now, almost every part of government is in its own way advancing the make in India agenda. And if it is taken to its logical conclusion from employment generation to increasing India's manufacturing and technological base, there are many opportunities, but it has to be done as a pan-India uh, national effort. And I think Dr. Carter's visit, if we get the politics right between India and the United States, we can have a number of stakeholders 
who go beyond the traditional Ministry of Defense and Armed Forces pyramid. And we are able to bring in the rest of the government. And in a way, I think that would realize much of the development agenda also that this country is seeking. And to my mind, that would be an enhancement of India's comprehensive <coughs> national power, mm -hmm. which has an economic dimension, a technological dimension, and a tangible military component where partnership with the U.S. Okay. is able to improve and give you a higher technological edge with a domestic manufacturing base. Okay. I think that's the critical part. And a last thought, Monmon. Very quickly. We engage with the Russians for many decades. Yet, apart from the strategic technologies, for instance, the nuclear, India's ability to absorb conventional military technology has been very modest. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to look at that experience okay. and do much better than what we did in the past. All right. Thank you, Commodore Bhaskar, Meera Shankar, and uh, Ev, uh, Vice Marshal Bahadur for having joined us on this show tonight. With Ashton Carter saying that India and uh, the United States are doing everything possible to ensure that the India-US strategic partnership realizes its full potential. This visit of Carter to India could prove to be quite substantial in taking the partnership forward. With that, we conclude uh, this program. Thanks for watching.